From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! I'm generally defined as a reporter on Palestinian issues. But, in fact, my reports are about the Israeli society and policies, about domination and its intoxications. My sources are not secret documents and leaked out minutes which were taken out of meetings of people with power and in power. My sources are the open ways by which the subjugated are being dispossessed of their equal rights as human beings. Israeli journalist Amira Hash, who was awarded the 2009 Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Women's Media Foundation, today she joins us in our firehouse studio. Then, murder in the name of honor. We speak with Rana Husseini, one of the world's leading advocates against so-called honor killings. But first, as lawmakers hash out the final costs of health care reform, we'll look at cashing in the war dividend. We'll speak with Joe Comerford about the country's military spending. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Afghanistan's headed toward a second round of voting in its disputed presidential elections. On Tuesday, Afghan President Hamid Karzai bowed to U.S. pressure and accepted a U.N. panel's findings that his August election victory was tainted by widespread fraud. The Independent Election Commission announced the second round of the election. We believe that this decision of the IEC is legitimate, legal, and constitutional, and that it strengthens the path towards democracy, and it is for the benefit of our nation. Karzai's chief rival, Abdullah Abdullah, praised the decision. The two will face off in a runoff vote next month. Karzai made the announcement after an intense round of meetings with a U.S. delegation, including Democratic Senator John Kerry. President Karzai himself had serious questions about the process. But today, he showed statesmanship by deciding to move forward and to strengthen the country by embracing the Constitution and the rule of law. Back in Washington, President Obama also praised Karzai's acknowledgement of election fraud. President Karzai, uh, as well as uh, the other candidates, I think, have shown uh, that they have the interests of the Afghan people at heart, uh, that uh, this is a reflection of a commitment to rule of law uh, and a, uh, an insistence that the Afghan people's will should be done. In other news from Afghanistan, the Pentagon's reversed a policy barring the publication of photos of U.S. soldiers killed in combat. The ban was initially introduced last month after the Associated Press published a photo of a mortally wounded U.S. Marine. The Senate's voted to authorize the transfer of Guantanamo prisoners for prosecution inside the United States. On Tuesday, Senators okayed the proposal as part of a $44 billion Homeland Security budget bill. The measure also backs the Obama administration's refusal to release photos of prisoner abuse, saying the photos can be kept under wraps for three years. The House has already passed its version of the bill, which now goes to President Obama for his signature. The Senate vote comes as the Supreme Court has agreed to rule on whether federal judges can authorize the release of Guantanamo prisoners into the United States. The move comes in the case of 13 Muslim Uyghurs from western China who remain jailed at Guantanamo despite the U.S. government's own determination they pose no national security threat. A judge ordered the Uyghurs release into the U.S. last year, but a federal appeals court later reversed that ruling. The top U.S. military commander in Iraq is warning the Obama administration could delay its pledge to withdraw all U.S. troops by the end of 2011. Speaking to the Times of London, General Ray Odierno said the U.S. could stay longer if Iraq fails to hold national elections early next year. The U.S. has been pressuring Iraq to hold the elections while also lobbying against a proposed referendum on whether to approve the U.S.-Iraqi Status of Forces Agreement, or SOFA. The agreement calls for a U.S. withdrawal by the end of 2011. But if Iraqis reject the timetable, U.S. troops would be forced to leave nearly a year earlier. 
Israel is claiming it's close to reaching a deal with the Obama administration that would allow for continued settlement construction in the occupied territories. In an interview with Al Jazeera, the Israeli ambassador to the United States, Michael Oren, said Israel would temporarily halt settlement construction instead of imposing a total freeze. Oren also says the Obama administration has given its assent to Israeli plans to complete ongoing settlement construction before the halt begins. In other Mideast news, a Palestinian protester confronted former British Prime Minister Tony Blair Tuesday as Blair visited the West Bank city of Hebron. Blair currently serves as Middle East peace envoy for the Quartet of the European Union, the United States, Russia, and the United Nations. His appointment has been criticized for his record in office, which includes launching the invasion of Iraq along with former President George W. Bush. As Blair toured a Hebron mosque, the protester approached him and called him a terrorist. In Iran, an Iranian-American scholar has been sentenced to 12 years in prison for taking part in the protests against Iran's disputed national elections. Ken Tajbaksh, who was previously jailed in 2007 for four months on charges of espionage, the U.S. is calling for Tajbaksh's immediate release. In Nicaragua, a Supreme Court panel has cleared the way for Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega to seek re-election after overturning a law on consecutive term limits. Opponents say the decision is illegal because it was approved only by members of Ortega's Sandinista party. Back in the United States, a new study says the U.S. can no longer afford to continue carrying out the death penalty. The Death Penalty Information Center says states and local governments facing budget crises would benefit from replacing capital punishment with lifelong prison terms. The report says since 1976, the death penalty has led to $2 billion in costs that wouldn't otherwise have been incurred had the harshest punishment been life in prison. A recent survey found 57 percent of police chiefs nationwide believe the death penalty has done little to deter violent crime. A former State Department official has been charged with accepting tens of thousands of dollars in kickbacks in exchange for doling out reconstruction contracts in Iraq. Richard Lopez Razo is believed to be the first State Department employee to face fraud charges in federal court in connection with the multi-billion dollar U.S. funded Iraq reconstruction projects. New figures show U.S. college tuition continues to rise. According to the College Board, tuition at four colleges is up 6.5 percent of public schools and 4.4 percent of private ones. The rate increases were the highest tuition costs have seen in over a decade. The average tuition at private colleges now tops $26,200 a year, compared to just over $7,000 for public institutions. In healthcare news, a new study has found the uninsured are far more likely to have undiagnosed and undertreated medical conditions than those with coverage. Harvard University researchers found half of uninsured people with diabetes were unaware of it, compared to just a quarter of insured people who also didn't know they had diabetes. The study authors say the disparities could help explain the findings of another recent study that found a lack of health insurance leads to around 45,000 deaths each year. In California, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors has voted to end a policy that orders police officers to contact immigration agents whenever they arrest a youth who they suspect is an undocumented immigrant. Critics say the law had led to the deportation of innocent youths and deterred immigrants from reporting crimes.